Hello everyone and welcome to the next review for Elaine Scarry's On Beauty and Being Just. In On Beauty and Being Just, Elaine Scarry not only defends beauty from recent political arguments against it, but also argues that beauty continually renews our search for truth and presses us toward a greater concern for justice. Taking inspiration from writers and thinkers as diverse as Homer, Plato, Marcel Proust, Simone Weil, and Iris Murdoch. Scarry writes an elegant, passionate manifesto for the revival of beauty in our intellectual work, as well as our homes, museums, and classrooms. So I read this book a fair while ago. It's another that I discovered through No Surprises, Art and Enchantment. It's a nice link to the previous review. Elaine Scarry uh, comes in to Patrick's book Fair Amount. He says, Elaine Scarry discusses the banishing of beauty as a legitimate subject of discussion from both art and the humanities in the 1980s and 1990s especially. And she unpe unpicks the lazy and questionable assumptions involved. For example, much modern discourse about art is really about politics, imposing a kind of single vision that silences other perspectives and values, not least enchantment. I was I actually included a footnote, a brief footnote to this book in my essay uh, Defiance and Half Light, which is about taking the time to appreciate nature and um and, and distancing oneself from the the acerbic and toxic and uh political sphere, I suppose, taking the time to we appreciate beauty and in that essay it's, in particular it was the beauty of the twilight the period of twilight so in this book Scarry is arguing essentially that beauty isn't something that distracts us from political engagements it, it, it doesn't it's not something uh, superfluous it's not uh, it's not distinct from the way that we live our lives and the way that we can make change Beauty, as she says, quickens, it adrenalizes, it makes the heart beat faster, it makes life more vivid, animated, living, worth living. And what I find particularly interesting about Scarry's take on beauty is that she doesn't, as far as I'm aware, as, as much as I understand and can remember from the book, she doesn't have a universalizing tendency when it comes to aesthetics. She writes that beauty is... Beauty always takes place in the particular, and if there are no particulars, the chance of seeing it go down. Essentially saying that the thing that we appreciate is, is, is incomparable. It reminds me of it's the irreplaceability of the other. So Patrick would call, in, in a word, essentially enchantment is, is what is not for sale. That thing that we appreciate, it cannot be replaced. It's not interchangeable. It can't be quantified. Um, it, it, it is, it's wholly concrete in that sense. It's, it's irreplaceable in that sense, but it's, it's, it's of the material world as well. Um, it's, it, beauty always takes place in the particular. So it's quite anti-platonic. Something I find fascinating in the book is that Scarry writes that she was never enamoured uh, of or, or by palm trees. She considered, she considered them as a category uh, and, and she didn't find them aesthetically pleasing. She wasn't drawn to them. But then as she spent more time looking at an individual palm tree, she realised that uh, she did indeed love palms. She, she, she had all these preconceived notions, again this very abstract and universal approach. But when she actually took the time to look at something, she began to appreciate it more. And so when she says, she says, now when I say that palms are beautiful or I love palms, it is really individual palms that I have in mind. Now, without going into the, the weeds of the argument, I'll just say that Scarry um, writes very uh, clearly and very movingly about beauty's ability to and still in a sense of, of the past, 
and uh, a sense that when we, whenever we contact something beautiful, it uh, allows us to to see our own capacity for self correction. Um, for example, what is beautiful prompts the mind to move chronologically back in the search for precedents and parallels, but also to move forward into new acts of creation, to move conceptually over, to bring things into relation, the importance of relationality uh, in, in Art and Enchantment, which I spoke about in my video on Art and Enchantment. He writes that the beautiful person or thing incites in us the longing for truth because it provides by its compelling, clear discernibility an introduction, perhaps even our first introduction, to the state of certainty, yet does not itself satiate our desire for certainty, since beauty sooner or later brings us into contact with our own capacity for making errors. The beautiful, almost without any effort of our own, acquaints us with the mental, the mental event of conviction, and so pleasurable a mental state is this, that ever afterwards one is willing to labour, struggle, wrestle with the world to locate enduring sources of conviction, to locate what is true. Both in the account that as assumes the existence of the immortal realm, platonic ideas of beauty, and in the account that assumes the non-existence of the immortal realm, beauty is a starting place for education. I love the way that Scarry writes about beauty. Um, Again, there's a particular, the particular aspect to beauty, the particularity of beauty, the relational aspect. And this, this idea of bridging gaps and um, being incited to create new things, but also to remember the, the past, other instances of beauty and, and to, connect, to connect things. It's all about connectivity, I think. Just read this excerpt here. I began here with the way beautiful things have a forward momentum the way they incite the desire to bring new things into the world. Infants, epics, sonnets, drawings, dances, laws, philosophic dialogues, theological tracts. But we soon find, uh, but we soon found ourselves also turning backward. For the beautiful faces and songs that lift us forward onto new ground keep calling out to us as well, inciting us to rediscover and uh, recover them in whatever new thing gets made. The very pliancy or elasticity of beauty, hurtling us forward and back, requiring us to break new ground, but obliging us also to bridge back not only to the ground we have just left, but to still earlier, even ancient ground. So the primary arguments that Scarry is arguing against in this book are that, first, beauty distracts attention from wrong social arrangements. It makes us inattentive and therefore eventually indifferent to the project of bringing about arrangements that are just. And the second is that when we stare at something beautiful, make it an object of sustained regard, our act is destructive to the object. Without going into the weeds of, of the argument, as it can get rather dense at times, I would just summarise and suggest that the, the first argument, the beauty distracts, is is wrong because beauty is a beauty is what makes us yearn for justness and fairness beauty is distributive it is what um, allows us to see fragility in things on a, a wider point here uh, scary suggests that beauty is fundamentally decentering it, it, it is beauty is what allows us to experience a vaster realm outside of ourselves which can only make us be more uh, seek out fairness for the other seek out justness for the other I suppose the second main prong that uh, or, of argumentation against beauty is the the, the, the act of looking is destructive or that we reify, we, we reify an object, a beautiful object. There are various strands to this argument, but the main point I took away from it is that actually beauty is what, in a sense, possesses us. We are unsafe when we contact the beautiful thing, a beautiful thing. Um, it is, it, it very much reminded me of 
the, the power of fairy. Fairy is the perilous realm. We, we a human looking at a beautiful thing, isn't in control. A beautiful thing, is dangerous in a sense. It is. Uh, it, it commands our attention. It's very. It's very animistic in the sense that. It has its own agency. It, it affects us. So what I particularly enjoyed about this book is that it, it really aligned with some of the ideas, imagery, um, concepts that I've been thinking about over the past several years. So for example, the uh, this idea, this notion of islands of meaning, that we perceive beauty in islands of, of meaning. Um, and Scary writes of Homer and Odysseus and his coming upon Nausicaa on the on the beach. And she describes um, Odysseus' experience of beauty as being life-saving. Beauty is life-saving. She also gives the um, example of Augustine describing beauty as a plank amid the waves of the sea. She herself writes that when we discover something beautiful, it is as though one has suddenly been washed up onto a merciful beach. Much later on in the book, she suggests that beauty is a call. It reminded me very much of Dunzani's, Lord Dunzani's line, the call is from afar, both in leagues and years, which connects with the, the uh, going forward, but also remembering the past and, and, and other instances of beauty that one has experienced. And finally, this idea of uh, that I'm playing around with uh, for a, a book that I eventually want to write um, about discovering the world hidden from us, remembering the storied and beautiful, walking with the earth. Um, and I think this is really quite captured by a single line here, but I will just give the context. At the moment we see something beautiful, we undergo a radical decentering. Beauty, according to Vail, uh, re requires us to give up our imaginary position as the centre, non anthropocentric a transformation then takes place at the very roots of our sensibility in our immediate reception of sense impressions and psychological impressions. We all speak matter-of-factly, often without illustration, implicitly requiring readers to test the truth of our assertion against their own experience. Our account is always deeply somatic. What happens, happens to our bodies, material. Material, concrete aspect of beauty there as well. When we come upon beautiful things, the tiny mauve orange blue moth on the brick, Augustine's cake, a sentence about innocence in Hampshire, these are different examples she's been using throughout the book, they act like small tears in the surface of the world that pulls us through to some vaster space, or they form ladders reaching toward the beauty of the world, or they lift us as though by the air currents of someone else's sweeping letting the ground rotate beneath us several inches, so that when we land we find we are standing in a different relation to the world than we were a moment before. Fantastic passage. I primarily want to bring up the uh, small tears in the surface of the world. I think I'm going to be mulling that line over and over in the coming months as I try to plan this book that I want to write. And also, it's a, it's a poignant line, um, ladders reaching toward the beauty of the world, although I will suggest that ladders is perhaps a little bit too transcendent, otherworldly. We could say a road through or a passage down deeper into the beauty, but um, it still works, I think. And again, that coming back to the land in a different relation to the world than we were a moment before is is a perfect encapsulation of the of the of the um, effect that beauty can have on our lives. So of course I've not went into all the detail regarding Scarry's argument in on beauty and being just, but I hope you get the, the sense of what this book is about. I do highly recommend it. It was written a while ago and it it, it tackles arguments 
from the 80s and 90s, but it's still very much uh, applicable, and indeed Patrick's included it in his 2023 book, Art and Enchantment. Thanks for watching, everyone. Until next time.